So welcome back, everybody. Um, our next speaker this afternoon is Fernando Gant, who will present his findings of a security assessment he carried out in behalf of the uh, United Kingdom's um, Center of the Protection of National Infrastructure uh, on the TCP/IP protocol. Thank you. Uh, hi, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, my name is Fernando Gant, and I will be presenting the results of. Um, project that I carried out on behalf of the UK CPNI. Uh, the project was about the security assessment of the TCP and IP protocols and of common implementation strategies. Uh, as an introduction of the work that I have been doing during the last few years, uh, I have been working on security assessment of computer protocols for the UK CPNI, and I have also been active at the ITF uh, working on uh, Internet RAS and RFCs, not only on focus on security, but also uh, focus on performance on the, of the protocols and interoperability issues too. Uh, finally, whenever I have the time to do it, I try to produce or contribute code to uh, open source operating systems. And there's the URL of my website where you can find the papers and work that I have been doing both for UK CPNI and for the IETF. Uh, well, what this presentation will be about, first of all, I will try to um, try to give a project overview, try to explain the motivations of this project and uh, an idea of the results that we got as a result of this project. Then I will focus the discussion on only two of the issues that are discussed in our documents. Just to give you an idea, uh, the result of our project was uh, a 130-page document for TCP and a 60-page document for IP. So, of course, we will, I will not be able to, to cover the whole thing in this presentation. Uh, then, finally, I will uh, provide some comments on future work that we are planning to do on the subject and some conclusions. And, finally, uh, we will jump to the questions and possibly answers on these issues. So first of all, let's start with a, with a description of, of this project. Uh, let's talk uh, first of all about the problem statement. All of you know that during the last 25 years, many vulnerabilities have been found in the TCP and IP protocols and in specific protocols, uh, protocol implementations. Uh, the documentation of these issues has traditionally been spread among too many documents in some cases, in websites of uh, people from the security community, while in others, they have been documented in vulnerability reports issued by vendors or, or certs. Uh, the problem uh, with TCP and IP security is that there's so much documentation that it's very hard to spot the right documentation. There are many documents that propose countermeasures that either don't mitigate the attacks that they are supposed to mitigate, or that they mitigate the attacks, but also have negative, negative implications on the interoperability of the protocol. That is, they mitigate the vulnerability implications, but on the other hand, they break the protocols. Um, finally, much of the work that the security community has done on TCP and IP security has never reflected into changes in the actual specifications of the protocols. Uh, if you look at the TCP and IP specifications right now, you'll probably see that they are basically vulnerable to all of the attacks that you have heard about, including SIM flus. Actually, we, at the ITF, we, uh, we got a document, an RFC published on SIM flus a couple of years ago, just to give you an idea of the state of affairs when it comes to the, to the specifications. Uh, a result of this problem, as a result of this problem, uh, many of the vulnerabilities that have been discovered and discussed in the past uh, have been reintroduced in new implementations of the protocols. That is, uh, all those implementations that, that strictly follow the specifications reintroduce many of, this, of the issues, many of the vulnerabilities that were found in the past. And also probably because of the lack of awareness about these issues, some mechanisms that have been known to have negative security implications were reintroduced in new protocols. Uh, a trivial example of this is the inclusion of the root, uh, routing header type 0 in IPv6. That's basically the IPv6 counterpart of IPv4 source routing. The security implications of IPv4 source routing have been known for many years, but even then, 
uh, a very similar functionality was included in IPv6. So uh, what was this project about? Uh, in 2005, the UK CPNI decided to start a project to try to fill this gap. Uh, we worked on this project from 2006 till 2008, uh, and the idea was basically to produce a set of documents that would serve as a roadmap to TCP and IP security. Uh, the, project, the project wasn't just about uh, trying to find new issues, uh, security vulnerabilities that had not been discovered before, but uh, rather to try to uh, review all the relevant documentation, analyze what had been published on the subject, and try to produce uh, a document that would uh, make it easy for an implementer to find the best possible ways to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Also, as part of this project, we, we, we did a, a thorough security assessment of the protocols, and in some cases, in some cases, we found some new use issues that at least had not been publicly discussed before. These two documents were, uh, are, have already been published. The one on uh, IPv4 security was released last year in August 2008, and the document about TCP security was released early earlier this year in February 2009. Uh, we were not aiming at providing like the final word on TCP and IP security, but rather we were uh, we wanted to have our documents be a starting point uh, for the community to focus its discussion. Uh, and our idea was to get feedback from the community and update the document, uh, the do our documents, if uh, it was necessary. And finally, our plan, our project was to uh, take the results of our project to the ITF. I mean, the problem is not really fixed until the, the, the actual specifications are fixed. So what we did is once we got the results from our project, we submitted our work to the ITF so that the specifications could be updated if it was felt necessary. Um, in both cases, we submitted an ITF uh, internet draft version of our document as soon as the, uh, the CPNI documents were published. And both of these documents have already been adopted by the, by the ITF. The IP security document has been adopted by the AppSec working group, whereas the uh, TCP security document was adopted by the TCPM working group. Uh, these documents have not yet been published as services, but are in the process of being published. So uh, uh, in many cases, many people may wonder why uh, why one would work on TCP and IP before security at this point in time, 2008, right? Something like 30 or 25 years later than the protocols were introduced. Uh, the problem here is that, or the, the, the situation here is that TCP and IP are still the most widely used protocols. Uh, there have been alternative proposals both for the transport layer and for the network layer. For example, in the case of the transport layer, there have been proposals such as SCTP, and in the case of network layer as IPv6. But uh, this does not mean that the protocols will be replaced in the near term. For instance, many, many, many uh, people proposing the adoption of, uh, the adoption of uh, IPv6 uh, have started to talk about uh, IPv6 and uh, IPv4 coexistence rather than the replacement. So it is usually assumed that all of these protocols will have to coexist for at least, 20, for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years, or maybe more. Also, uh, an interesting thing here is that many of the issues, for example, uh, many of the security implications of IPv4 and many of the mitigation techniques that you can, uh, that you can uh, design for IPv4 can still be applied to IPv6. So it's not that the work is just on old technology, but uh, it's also relevant for those new protocols that uh, have been proposed. Um, in addition, uh, I, have, I have attended the, the ITF meeting that was, at, uh, that was uh, held last week, and uh, it was, so not so, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say surprising, but uh, many of uh, the TCP and IP security issues that were discussed in our documents uh, have been discussed in other contexts. For example, there, are working, there is a working group uh, working on network address translators, and they had to reevaluate many of the TCP IP security issues that we have discussed here. And even in the case of DNS, as a result of IPv6 and DNSSEC, 
um, turns out that it's very likely that we will end up relying on, on TCP for requests and responses in, in DNS. And uh, this has brought the, the, the security and resiliency of, of TCP back into question. Uh, no need to say that probably working on TCP and IPv4 is not a very glamorous uh, topic to work on. People usually prefer to, uh, to work on more recent stuff or more new st or newer stuff, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, working on these protocols uh, is, is useless. useless. So uh, as a brief overview of some areas uh, on which we have worked, uh, one of them was to propose sanity checks that should be performed on header fields, options, and so on. In some cases, these proposed checks were straightforward, so there was, uh, th there was uh, not much thought to give, uh, to give it about. But in other cases, the, um, the checks that should be performed on either protocol header fields or, or on, or on uh, TCP or IP options were not really straightforward, and actually uh, we discussed these checks with many of the people uh, involved in the, in the standardization of, of these protocols. Um, another area of work was to identify that those TCP and AP options that currently have non-legitimate use. If you go to the, um, uh, to the relevant specifications, you may find out that, for example, there are something like 30 TCP options that have been defined. And in many cases, it's even hard to track the specification of those options. Uh, to a large extent, that documentation is outdated. So uh, we spend quite, uh, quite a lot of time trying to figure out whether some options were currently in use or not. In some cases, it's, it was obvious. In other cases, it was not. And in some cases, we thought uh, at some point that they were not being used, but then it turned out that in some specific scenarios, they were being used, so uh, it wasn't possible to just recommend to, to filter packets containing those options or, or whatever. Then, there, uh, then we... Um, we work on some algorithms for selecting uh, some protocol header fields of options. For example, algorithms uh, to set the IP identification field, TCP ephemeral ports, TCP timestamps, and so on. Sometimes it's, it's, it's funny to talk about algorithms for setting these fields because uh, in many cases people know that, uh, for example, you shouldn't set these fields in such a way that uh, it's easy to, to predict those values. But even then, there are uh, so many implementations that do it in the wrong way. Even a couple of years ago, when there was all this press around the DNS vulnerabilities that had been discovered by Dan Kaminsky, uh, lots of people were working or trying to figure out the most appropriate way or the best possible way to do port randomization. Uh, we also uh, did an analysis of uh, some protocol mechanisms that could be exploited, such as PADMTU discovery. In some cases, it was possible to completely eliminate the vulnerabilities. In others, uh, we mitigated them, make, make, uh, made it harder for an attacker to exploit them. And uh, we finally worked on or, or tried to improve, improve uh, some protocol policies that uh, were known to have negative security implications. Again, if you follow the relevant standards, uh, when it comes, for example, uh, to YP fragment reassembly or TCP congestion control or the like, uh, you will find out that if you follow the standards, uh, chances are that you, your implementation will be vulnerable to, to trivial attacks. So, um, I, uh, as I said before, there was a lot of information in these documents. I just selected two of them, two, two different issues. Uh, one of them is the, the recent, uh, or the supposedly new TCP denial of service attacks. Uh, one of the reasons for which I selected this particular topic is because uh, information on this topic has been scarce, and uh, for the last couple of years there have there has been like a lot of uh, speculation about what these vulnerabilities uh, were about. And uh, as part of the work that we did on TCP and IP, we were uh, involved. Uh, in a cooperation with vendors trying to provide advice on how to mitigate these, these issues. So <clears throat> the first discussion will be, or the first, uh, yeah, the first description will be about what has been, or what, uh, what is known as the SOC stress uh, vulnerabilities. If, if it's the first time that you have heard about the vulnerabilities, just as a, uh, as a summary, 
Uh, last year in 2008, a uh, couple of researchers from a company called Outpost24 announced that they had found uh, a few vulnerabilities in TCP that were like the killing denial of service attacks. And, but they didn't provide any details about what the vulnerabilities uh, were about. This was very similar to what happened a couple of years ago with, D with the DNS vulnerabilities that were announced to the press. Uh, there was all this speculation about what, what the impact of the vulnerability was and, and what the vulnerabilities were about, but no information was provided. Additionally, uh, uh, this company didn't provide any proposed countermeasures for vendors, so the idea was, well, you have this problem, uh, these vulnerabilities uh, would allow an attacker to take your system down, but uh, we are not proposing any way to, to mitigate them. So uh, at this point in time, when these, uh, these vulnerabilities were disclosed to vendors, we had been working on this stuff for a couple of years or so. So um, the, our involvement with these vulnerabilities was basically providing advice to vendors. In some cases, we, we did not only have to provide or, or propose countermeasures, but sometimes even to try to explain what the vulnerabilities were about, because even for vendors, the information was scarce. So uh, these Soxtress vulnerabilities are basically connection flooding attacks. Uh, what you have probably, what you probably know as NAFTA and Finway 2 flooding attacks. There are a couple of vulnerabilities that uh, target the socket uh, send buffer, and finally there is a vulnerability that targets the TCP reassembly uh, buffer. So uh, what follows is uh, a discussion of these vulnerabilities from our point of view. That is. Uh, the, the analysis that we had made of these vulnerabilities and the countermeasures that we could come up, uh, come up with. So let's start, first of all, attacks, NAFTA and Finway 2. The idea, is, uh, the idea behind these vulnerabilities is very simple. In order to, uh, when you establish a TCP connection with a remote system, uh, the establishment of a TCP connection requires both, both TCP endpoints to maintain a state for that connection. Uh, that of keeping state, of course, means that you will have to store some values in memory, such as seconds numbers, acknowledgement numbers, options in use, and so on. And of course, as memory is a, is a limited resource, uh, if you establish lots and lots of connections, at some point you will hit the limit, and you will prevent the attack system from being able to handle legitimate connections. This attack uh, was known as NAFTA, and there was a vulnerability report published in 2000. So we are talking about an eight-year-old vulnerability. As it has been the case with other vulnerabilities, sometimes there has been discussion about what the problem was, but there was never a discussion about how to fix the problem. Uh, we, we have found this to be the case with many of the TCP security issues that we discussed in our document. So uh, <coughs> um, the idea basically is for an, that an attacker will establish lots of, uh, of TCP connections with the target system. And of course, in order to avoid uh, wasting or exhausting his own resources, uh, the attacker will bypass the kernel implementation of TCP and establish the, connection, uh, and establish the TCP connection by sending uh, crafted packets. So uh, this is a, a very small diagram that tries to show what an, an attacker would do to, to exploit this vulnerability. Basically, he would uh, perform the three-way handshake, but the only, th the only uh, special thing that is about the three-way handshake is that instead of relying on the kernel implementation of TCP, the, the attacker would craft a, a scene segment and would send it to the target system. Uh, the attacker will not will not keep in his own system any state information for that scene segment that he has sent. So uh, every connection that he establishes with the target system doesn't cost him anything else than that of sending the, the corresponding packets. So the attacker crafts a scene segment. As soon as he's re he receives a CNAC in response to that, he simply acts whatever CNAC he received, right? So it's not necessary to keep track of the seconds number or acknowledgement numbers or anything. At the point he acknowledges the CNAC, the connection on the uh, victim side, of course, will have been established. And at that point, the attacker simply forgets about the connection. So this basically means that after this three-way handshake, there's a connection in the established state on the victim side. But on the attacker side, there's no memory tied to this connection. 
So what about the countermeasures for this attack, NAFTA? Well, basically the problem with uh, many of the attacks that, or many of the vulnerabilities that we will discuss is that there's no clear difference between uh, an attack scenario and a scenario in which a system is simply under heavy load. Among the possible countermeasures could be to enforce per user and per process limits. For example, this could help if I had a system that was running a web server and an SSH server. Well, I don't want an attack against my web server uh, to, deny, uh, to deny the server the, the service of SSH, right? I still want to be able to log into the, to the system to manage it. Uh, and then another possible countermeasure is to enforce uh, limits on the number of ongoing connections, either at the application layer or at the firewall. That basically means that if you have a single system that, for example, has established 200 connections, 1,000 connections, then chances are that that may be malicious activity and you may decide to drop some of those connections. Again, there may be legitimate uh, reasons for establishing many connections. In the case of enforcing this type of limits at the application layer, of course, this requires lots of extra ma machinery at the application layer, which I would say most, if not uh, no one of the existing applications has. But you can still enforce these limits with a, with a firewall. For example, OpenBSD PF allows you to uh, enforce a limit on the number of ongoing connections from a single, uh, from a single endpoint. So let's jump to the Finway 2 fluting attack. The idea, of, the idea behind the Finway 2 flooding attack is basically the same as that of NAFTA, with the only difference that instead of the, instead of the uh, malicious connections staying in the established state, the connections will stay in the Finway 2 state. So let's revise the uh, connection termination uh, mechanism in TCP. It's uh, composed of the change of four packets. The idea is basically that each endpoint has to close uh, it, uh, one direction of the connection. So in this case, TCP A is the one that performs what's usually called the active open. It closes its side of the connection, and when that fin segment is acknowledged, uh, TCP A enters the fin way to state. Uh, there are two things that are uh, interesting from a security point of view about the fin way to state. One of them is that there is no limit on the amount of time that the connection can stay in the fin way to state. That basically means that TCPA, TCPA could, re, could stay in the Finway 2 state forever. Uh, a second interesting issue about the, fin, uh, the Finway 2 state is that usually when a connection is in the Finway 2 state, there's no controlling process for that connection, which basically means that you issued uh, a close call, and as a result of issuing a close call, you engage the kernel into the uh, connection termination process so you can no longer control the underlying connection. Uh, so this makes the Finway 2 state very attractive for uh, an attacker to, to exploit. Uh, I, yeah, it's in the wrong order. So this is uh, a simple scenario of, uh, of a possible uh, exploitation of the Finway 2 attack. Uh, what an attacker would do is first of all establish uh, a TCP connection with the target system. Um, the, the attacker would establish the connection in exactly the same way as with the NAFTA attack. That is, he, uh, the attacker would not engage its, uh, his um, TCP kernel implementation, but would rather craft the scene packet and the acknowledgement packet to establish that connection. That is, the attacker doesn't want to tie his own system resources to each of the connection that he establishes. So he crafts a scene segment, and as soon as he gets a response, the SYNAC, he will do two things. One of them is acknowledge that SYNAC packet so that the connection on the victim side enters the uh, established, established state. And after that, he'll probably send an application request. The, the, the idea of, or, or the, the only purpose of sending the application request is to do something that would cause the victim to actually close the connection. As an example, for example, if, if you uh, connect to a POP3 server and you issue a quit command, that would cause the uh, POP3 server to actually start closing the TCP connection. So you want to do something that would lead the victim system to start the connection termination phase. So as a result of the application request, he'll probably get an application response, and right after that, 
uh, the attack system would send a fin segment for closing that direction of the data transfer. Once uh, the attacker receives the fin segment, he would basically just acknowledge that, that fin segment and forget about the connection. At that point, uh, the connection on the victim side would remain in the finway 2 state. And uh, if the victim implementation of TCP follows the TCP specifications uh, strictly, that connection could remain in the finway 2 state forever. So uh, what about the countermeasures for the finway 2 uh, flooding attack? Well, uh, one of the basic countermeasures that has been uh, implemented in a number of operating systems is to try to enforce a limit on the maximum length that is allowed for the finway 2 state. For example, Linux uh, enforces a limit of 60 seconds uh, for the finway 2 state. Of course, this only assures that a, con a connection will not remain forever in the finway 2 state, but does not actually eliminate the vulnerability. Actually, an, att an attacker could simply uh, uh, as soon as a connection is uh, removed from the finway to state, he could just uh, establish other connections uh, and leave those connections in the finway to state just to uh, still be able to, to perform this, this attack. Uh, another possible uh, countermeasure is to enforce a limit on the number of ongoing connections with no controlling process. Uh, the problem with such connections are, is that um, it's, as there is no controlling process. It's virtually impossible for an application to enforce limits on those connections. Uh, well, all the other countermeasures that we discussed for the NAFTA attack still applies. This is, after all, a connection flooding attack. The only thing that has changed is that instead of being in the established state, connections are in the Finway 2 state. So, those countermeasures still apply. However, when it comes to uh, applications enforcing limits, of course, in this case, uh, it wouldn't be possible because, again, there's no controlling process for those connections. And one thing that is, could be in interesting to include in application that is actually something very trivial to implement is replace a call to the, the call to close with a combination of a sex up, up a shutdown, and close so that the application can retain control of the connection for a longer period of time. So that basically means that the application will be able to enforce limits on the number of ongoing connections uh, for states in which uh, otherwise it wouldn't be able to, to do so. So uh, next vulnerabilities are the socket send buffer vulnerabilities. Uh, basically, when an application uh, uh, gives TCP some data to transmit or to, to transfer to the remote endpoint, TCP will keep those data in the socket uh, send buffer. So uh, the idea is simple. What, uh, what an attacker would try to do here is to uh, cause, cause the attacker system to uh, retain or, or keep lots and lots of data in the socket send buffer so that it would tie lots of memory for those connections. Uh, there are two possible ways to actually exploit this uh, vulnerability. One of them is to uh, establish a connection, a TCP connection with the target system, send an application request so that the victim system has something to send back to the attacker. And uh, once the victim uh, tries to uh, transfer that response, that application response to the attacker, the attacker simply ignores that response so that the, uh, the, attack, it, the attack system has to retransmit that response over and over again. Another vector for exploiting the socket set buffer is to do exactly the same, establish a TCP connection, send uh, an application uh, request, and then right after that, announce or advertise a TCP window of zero so that the victim system refrain, actually refrains from sending that response. So the first of these vectors is what has been known as netkill. I don't recall exactly uh, the year in which this issue was uh, discovered, but it probably dates back to 2003, or maybe 2004, or maybe even 2001. Um, uh, well, as I said before, the, the goal of the attacker is to tie uh, the system memory at the victim system. Uh, he wants the victim system to, uh, to create a response for the application request that the attacker sent. And the attacker wants that response to remain in the socket, in, in, in the socket uh, send buffer for uh, as much time as, as possible. 
So this is a possible scenario for a net kill attack. Again, the attacker will establish a TCP connection with the victim system. Uh, again, the attacker doesn't want to tie his own resources to these uh, malicious connections. So instead of engaging its uh, kernel implementation of TCP to establish the connections, he will craft a SIM packet and will craft all those packets that are necessary to, to handle or to manage the, the corresponding connection. So the attacker sends uh, a SIM segment, he gets the response, the SIMAC, and right after that what he does is send an acknowledgement so that the connection enters the established state on the, on the victim side. And right after that, he sends, for example, an HTTP uh, request. The idea here is simply that he wants to send a request to the victim system such that it produces a large amount of data that will be queued in the socket uh, send buffer. Right after that, the uh, victim will send or will try to send or transfer the response back to the attacker, and the attacker will simply ignore that response. Uh, so here we can see uh, that the HTTP server sends back a response. And as the attacker doesn't, uh, doesn't acknowledge that response, the HTTP server has to re retransmit that response over and over again. At some point in time, the connection will, of course, time out. But usually, uh, the timeout values are in the range of minutes, so that for each of these established, established connections, uh, the, the attacker uh, will be wasting resources at the victim system for quite a few minutes. So uh, countermeasures for the, uh, for the net kill attack, again, it's very hard to, uh, it's very hard to propose countermeasures for this attack because uh, and, and another scenario doesn't differ or does not necessarily differ that much from a scenario in which a system is simply under high load. But even then, there are uh, some countermeasures that can be applied. For example, measure connection, pro uh, connection progress at the application layer. That is that if you are whatever system, uh, maybe an HTTP server, and uh, somebody has established a TCP connection with you, but you have not been able to, s to actually successfully transfer data over that connection, well, that could probably be a hint that, the, um, that you are wasting resources for something uh, from which you are not getting anything useful. Uh, another possible countermeasure uh, is to not, do not use unnecessarily large sockets and buffer. Uh, the larger the buffer, the, the more memory that an attacker has, uh, can cause you to, to waste in this attack. Then you can enforce per user and per process limits. The idea here is the same. You don't want an attack against a specific service to affect the whole, the whole system. And you can um, implement limits on the uh, number of ongoing connections, for example, on a, on, a, on a per IP address or per prefix basis. Of course, this of in, uh, enforcing limits uh, on a per prefix or per IP address basis uh, will only work or will only help if the attacker is, uh, is performing his attack from a single system, right? So if there was a, 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 a distributed version uh, of this attack, of course, these um, countermeasures of enforcing limits on a, uh, based on the IP addresses will not uh, provide any help. And finally, uh, even if you implement these countermeasures that we have described, at some point in time, you may be hitting the limits of the, of the amount of resources that, uh, uh, that you are spending on these connections. So at some point in time, you may, have to, you may need to drop some of these, of these connections. Uh, two possible parameters that could be of help uh, when you have to decide which connections to drop uh, would be one of them uh, to drop those connections that uh, so far have transferred only a small amount of, of data, which would be the case of, uh, of the existing tools for the NetKill attack, and also to have a look or, or, or to pay particular interest in those connections that have a large amount of data queued. Of course, these, uh, these hints are not perfect, but at the point in time in which you need to actually drop connections, uh, they may provide hints about which connections are the, the best candidates for this. Uh, the second of the vectors for, uh, um, for exploiting the socket send buffer is uh, basically to exploit the uh, TCP sliding window mechanism. Uh, so in this case, what the attacker will do is 
do is, uh, establish a TCP connection in the same way as he did for NetQ, send an application request again, but right after he has uh, established that TCP connection, he will announce a t or will advertise a TCP window of zero. Uh, that of advertising a TCP window of zero will cause the victim system to refrain for, from actually transferring the response back to the, to the attacker. So this is a, a possible attack scenario in which the attacker establishes the, the the TCP connection, again, crafting the corresponding packets rather than relying on the kernel implementation of TCP. Once the connection is established, he will send uh, an HTTP request or whatever application request. Uh, and probably in the same segment or probably in the next segment, he will announce a window, a TCP window of zero. That will cause the victim system on the right to refrain from sending the HTTP response because, of course, that of announcing or advertising a TCP window of zero, of zero is like saying the remote endpoint, well, I'm not ready, I'm not prepared to receive any data on this connection. In this case, the victim system will send window proofs just to try to find out whether the window opens at some point, but uh, in this case, the connection uh, will not time out. When it comes to the countermeasures, the problem is, again, similar to the, to the previous vulnerabilities. Sometimes it's hard to, uh, uh, to separate uh, high load scenarios or, or, or particular network scenarios from, uh, from ADACs. Some people have proposed within the ITF to simply enforce a limit on the amount of time that a connection, uh, a connection or an endpoint can be advertising a TCP zero window. But of course, that wouldn't stop the ADAC. Uh, because what an attacker could do if you were to implement that, that check or that countermeasure would be to uh, close the window and uh, after a while open the window a little bit and go back to closing the window. So basically the countermeasures for this attack are uh, very similar or sort of the same as those for NetKill. Uh, measure uh, connection progress at the application layer. If somebody has established a, a TCP connection with you and uh, the connection has been established for quite a long time and you have not been able to successfully transfer data over that connection, well, you're wasting, you're wasting your resources. Uh, and then as with the previous cases, you can enforce limits on a per uses or per process basis and try to enforce limits on the number of ongoing connections. Again, those limits on, on, on a per IP address or per prefix basis uh, will not stop a distributed version of, of this attack. Uh, last one of this family of attacks is the, an attack against the TCP reassembly buffer. Basically, TCP can, uh, can receive information out of order, but in order to be able to deliver that, uh, those data, those received data to the application, uh, there cannot be any holes in the data stream. So this figure uh, shows a case in which there is a hole, that, that is a, a piece of data is missing, what is number as one there, so uh, the rest of the data, the rest of those uh, five, uh, five pieces of data are out of order. So in that, in that case, that uh, an attacker could uh, intentionally introduce a hole in the TCP data stream so that he sends more data after, the ho after that hole. The receiving TCP queues that information, but is not able to deliver that information to the victim system. Uh, there are two possible ways to, uh, to, ex to exploit this vulnerability. One is simply to send a large amount of data right after the hole, and another one is to try to uh, target the overhead that sometimes is uh, related to, to keeping these data structures. As an example, there are some implementations that even to store a single byte of data in memory, they will allocate a whole page for that. So that of uh, sending a single, a single byte of data may cause the, the receiving TCP to uh, to waste more resources than just that single byte of data. Uh, well, in this case, the, the, um, there are a number of checks that an implementation could perform. For example, limit the, the number of holes that can be in the data stream at any point in time. However, the problem is not as bad as with the previous vulnerabilities because in this case, uh, TCP never acknowledges the, those data that have been received out of order. So in the event that you are running out of resources, you can simply discard those data that you have received out of order. And finally, a very brief discussion about uh, remote operating system detection about uh, via TCP IP stack fingerprinting. Most of you, or probably all of you, have already used the Nmap tool. It uses a number of uh, 
uh, a number of uh, proof packets to try to fingerprint the uh, remote TCP IP stack. And it's amazing the precision with which uh, these type of tools can uh, guess uh, the, the operating system in use at the, remote, uh, at the remote system. So the question was, well, is this really necessary? I mean, uh, should it be possible for these type of uh, applications to uh, have such a precision? So what we did is we, uh, we perform an analysis of all the different proof packets and we were able to come with, was, uh, with the, 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 the right answer or the right response for each of these proof packets that tools such as NMAP sends. Uh, we have sent the, the, our results to vendors but we are not aware that they have already committed these changes or even if they are willing to do this. Uh, but uh, what we would expect is that in the long term if these changes are applied, at least when it comes to these fingerprinting techniques, these type of tools wouldn't have the, the precision that they have right now. There are other, uh, other techniques for uh, fingerprinting uh, a, remote, uh, a remote operating system. For example, another one is that of TCP options. Different systems include different options in their connections. They set the options to different values and sometimes they frame the options differently. Uh, in this case, uh, it's most of all, there's no like right answer to how to frame these options or which uh, or how to set these values by default. So more work is, is needed to try to get or, or try to convert so that all or most of the systems uh, include the same options or set and frame the same options in the in the same way. Uh, as further work about uh, this stuff that I have presented here, uh, we, as I mentioned before, we are pursuing this uh, project within the ITF. Uh, these documents are being discussed within the TCPM working group and the OPSEC working group. Uh, here I am providing the URL so that you can join the relevant mailing list. Uh, it would be very interesting to get more eyes uh, to look at these papers. Uh, the more people that review these documents, uh, chances are that we will be able to improve them and as a result of that this will usually, uh, th this will probably lead into better uh, implementations. And uh, finally, uh, as conclusions about this project, uh, probably from the point of view of, of, of the community in general, uh, that of working on, on TCP and IP before security at this point in time didn't have much glamour. Usually when you talk about working on TCP or IP before stuff, it's like old stuff, everything has been done on the subject, but still in 2009 there is lots, lots of work to do in actual implementations. Uh, that of the SOC 3 vulnerabilities that were uh, disclosed uh, earlier uh, this year uh, should give you a hint that uh, the actual implementations that we are still using for TCP and, and IP uh, have not addressed all these issues. But a good part of, or, or uh, a good result that we got from this project is that now we have a document on which uh, lo uh, many people from the community are looking at and we are converging uh, to what's supposed to be the, the best possible practices uh, for dealing with all these issues. Uh, I don't think I have qu time for questions. Uh, I would just like to, uh, ac uh, to um, acknowledge UKCP and I for supporting my work and also the DeepSec uh, organizers because they have worked like very hard from trying to arrange the travel details and uh, for everything else. So if you have any questions, you can drop me an email or we can uh, get together in the social event or in the lobby. So thank you. Thank you very much. For